Good morning. You guys still didn't get the memo from last week that, that just because you sit in the back, it's not, it's, you know, God's not at the front of the building. Remember that? Some of you, some of you right here, you're like, what? Yeah. Yeah, the back row. I was like, yeah, there's a lot of great seats up here. How many of you go to a concert and sit in the back, like the back? Like one of you? Well, it's all you over 65. You're like, ah, oh, it's too loud. So don't, yeah, don't even act like it's, yeah. yeah. Church is like, let's sit in the back. It's the best seat. So anyway, I'm just giving you a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, these seats don't cost any more than the other ones. You know that, right? It's funny. Well, I'm glad you're here. It's going to be a great day today. So uh, um, just want to encourage you to, uh, as we pray before we begin the service, I want you to pray with me um, for the nation of Israel. You know, they're going through all kinds of nonsense over there and, and, and our government isn't helping out at all. So, you know, uh, this is just all part of where the things are going. Uh, so I want you to know, don't be discouraged or disheartened or fearful uh, because uh, God knew this before it ever started. So, um, so we're, our, our job is to continue just to preach the gospel. Pray for Israel, preach the gospel, okay? God knows what's going on. His, hands in, his hand is upon his people, his hands on the nation. So they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna come through it, okay? So, but we're gonna pray for them because it tells us to pray for them. So we need to constantly be in prayer for Israel. So today as we kind of launch into this and as we launch into this morning, uh, we're gonna pray over them as, as well. So if you will, let's just close our eyes or whatever you like to do, lift your hands if you like. But Father, we thank you for uh, your awesome nature, your name that is above all names, that it is at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. It means every religion, every country, every state, every name must surrender to the name of Jesus. And so today we just lift you up. We exalt you above circumstance. We exalt you above our current status in this world or what's going on in this world because you are mightier and greater than all these things. And so we just lift you up. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel. We pray that your protection is upon them. Lord, that all those that come against them, uh, they will be defeated easily. They will be stricken down. They will be brought to nothing as your word always tells us. And so we thank you that your hand is upon your people and your hand is against those that are trying to destroy them. So we thank you today for protection and peace over our brothers and sisters. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are exposing those responsible for the lies. And we thank you for all this today. We love you and we are honored to be a part of the kingdom. And we thank you that we get to present the gospel. And we thank you for this morning for the gospel of Jesus and the word of God that sets us free and brings us life. And so today we open up our hearts to receive and to hear what it is that you're saying because it's life. So we just take a big breath of life this morning and we thank you and honor you for everything that you are and what you're doing today in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Luke chapter 18, if you've got your Bibles, we're gonna launch out from there in a series called The Reprogrammer. It's a sub-series of, of a series that we were in for a while called uh, Reprogramming, where we were talking about uh, changing the way we see the gospel, transforming our mind to see the gospel. Because if you've been in church for any significant amount of time, you've heard the gospel in a sense that Jesus came, died for your sins. But uh, it's been a little diluted and a little bit uh, kind of, of clouded. And what I mean by that is that religion, uh, religion messes a lot of things up really fast. And the reason is, is because uh, we as a people uh, struggle with freedom because freedom feels a little bit scary. Um, freedom feels a little scary to have your own freedom. How many knows that when you remember whenever you uh, were in your parents' home and you went out of your parents' home, how you were like, I can't wait to be free. And you got free and you're kind of like, this is a little scary out here. Yeah. And the reason is, is because it's, it's your choices now. You get to choose. And so it's a little bit scary because beforehand, you know, your parents are like, you can't do this. And you're like, oh, you're just evil, you know, and all this stuff. And so it's kind of like this big tug of war. But then you got freedom and you're like, oh my God, what do I do now? I don't have any money. Clothes are dirty all the time, you know, and it's just all these different things. And so what's interesting is that we struggle with freedom. So we're trying to reprogram the way that we see the gospel, but also uh, realize that the reprogrammer, the Holy Spirit, is the one that is, is responsible. He's the one that is transforming us. It's not like you're just trying to think differently and try to think more positively uh, because your real willpower will run out really quick uh, because the circumstances that you will face will get bigger than your mind, but they will never be bigger than your spirit than the spirit of God within you. So that is where we function from is belief comes from the heart or from the who you are, not from your mind, okay? So we're gonna change the way we believe the gospel and the foundational core beliefs of who we are, okay? So this morning, go to Luke chapter 18. Anyone here like to read reviews or give reviews? So, so we're a culture now that you can review everything. You can get on like 
Welp or Zelp or something. You can give a review and read reviews. And our culture likes this because we get to give our opinion. How many of you love to give your opinion? Come on, just lift your hand because you love to give your opinion. And you're like, uh, yeah, we have an opinion about, I have an opinion about everything. I watch football. I've got an opinion about every play they're running. Like, why are we doing this? What's going on? Come on. You got an opinion about how people dress. I don't know why they wear that. It doesn't work for them. Right? We, we got opinions. We act like we don't. We act like, oh, no, I don't pay attention. Oh, we have opinions about everything. And what's crazy about it is we like to give those opinions. Now, so, this is, so we, we, me and dad flew out to California this last week to do some baseball things. And what's interesting about this flight is on the way back, I had this lady sitting, my seatmate was sitting next to me. And you know, we're in a, we're in a row of two, just me and her. And she's probably, I'd say she's probably in her maybe 50s, late 60s. Six, six, one of those two, I don't know. Anyway, so we, she's just talking the whole time, just talking to me the whole time. And so, and you know, we're on like a plane that wasn't that big. So it's a little terrifying, you know, and, and she's just talking. And she's loud talking, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know how on an airplane you can't really hear? Oh, she has no problem. She's talking so everybody could hear. And so she's talking about this. Well, she's talking about the vibrations of the plane back here where we are and how the last plane she was on wasn't like that. So maybe they forgot to tighten some rivets. I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing? You know, and so, so we're going through this whole conversation. And, she's, and so, so at the end of the flight, so it's such a small plane that the stewardess actually has to pull a seat that's from behind the seats and lay it down so she can sit down. So she's literally, when she sits down, Pops is on this side of the aisle, I'm on this side. She's literally sitting elbow to elbow with us. So the stewardess is sitting right here. So we're about to, we're, we're coming in to descend into Tulsa. This lady finds the perfect opportunity to ask the stewardess where she can send a comment to about the flight. <laughs> over me. Okay, so not to wait till we get off the plane, you can have your conversation. Over me loud. So where can I leave my opinion about this flight? I'm like, oh God, here we go. And, and the stewardess is like, well, ma'am, you know, you can go online, stuff like this. She said, because I got something to say because I could tell you one thing, the vibrations in this plane are not like the other plane that I have been on today and something's going on. And I'm thinking, are you a mechanic? Are you an airline mechanic? Or, you know, because, you know, I'm in my mind, but I'm just like, but this is what's going in my mind. I'd like to have thrown her out the window, but we didn't have a window, so I just could... Hope she doesn't never watches this, but anyway. So anyway, so we're having this conversation. So the lady's like trying to be real polite and all that stuff. And so she finally just tells her, well, they determined that this plane is safe. And she used they. You know, so you used they, they. Oh, obviously they said, okay, so we're good. And so the lady was like, okay. But it was interesting. I, I thought that, that she wanted to give her opinion about the flights. Like, um, like United's gonna be like, oh my God. We got an opinion today that there's some vibration in this one plane. We better check that out. You know, because it wasn't like they didn't check the plane out before we took off. You know what I mean? But it's interesting because she felt like that I need to give my opinion. Why? Because my opinion is going to change things. So I, I thought about it like this because we like to give our opinion because we think um, we have the answer, right? I mean, I, obviously, that's why I give my opinions because my answers are really good. And so if you'll take them, your life will be. So what if someone was to ask you this question? How do I have the best life? How do I have the best quality of life? I mean, how many of you would have a great opinion about that? What's interesting about that opinion, I mean, it would be probably in of alignment to how you operated your life, unless your life you felt like is not that great. And then you'd be like, I don't know, you need to talk to somebody that's rich. I don't know what, you're, I don't know what to tell you. So we would go this, we'd be like, hey, you know, I did this. You know, you give them the places you did, the things you did, or all that. Or you'd say, you know, uh, here's a plan. You need to, here's your financial plan, or you need to marry somebody rich. You know, you'd be, you'd have all kinds of opinions, right? Because how many knows everybody's going to marry somebody rich? Even us guys, we're going to marry somebody rich. Why? Do I have to work a day of my life? And so, so that's kind of the idea. And it's always about trying to get to the best quality of life. Okay, I want you to go to Luke chapter 18. We're going to start there, and we're going to kind of talk about this, because... Um, I think if we were to survey the, the body of Christ, not just this one, but just every church, we would ask people, do you think you're living your best quality of life? I'm gonna say probably a majority, if it was a blind study, because we wouldn't be honest if someone was like, hey, you enjoy your life? You're like, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, but I grow up every day, but I still love my life. You know, that kind of a deal. But it would be one of those things where, where we would probably say a majority of people would be like, I don't really, I'm not really happy with where I am. My life is a little bit this or that. And so Luke chapter 18 is I want you to see because 
uh, this kind of question kind of came up and Jesus gave an answer to it. And let's look at verse 18. We're gonna read down through about verse 23. Now, a certain ruler asked him, saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? This is what I found. So I, this is, sometimes things jump out at me in the Bible. It, it was Jesus who is amazing, tells a guy who says, good teacher, and he stops him and is like, why do you call me good? There's only one good and it's God. Yeah, but you're really good too, Jesus. But notice how he was like, there's only one good and it's him. He didn't even receive the guy's compliment. He was just like, there's only one good. Why do you call me good? He's the one that's good. And I thought, wow, what a crazy answer that he gave because I would have been like, yeah, I'm a pretty good guy. But Jesus is like, no, only he's good. Now watch this. He's no one is good, but that is God. You know the commandments because he asked him, what should I do to have the best life, eternal life? Eternal life means perpetual life, life that continues to be good and good and better and better. What must I do? So he says this, you know the commandments. So here's, here's what we would think. Yeah, this is a good plan. He's gonna give him a good plan. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. That's a good, that's good thing to not do. Do not murder. That's really good to don't do that, right? Do not steal. Still good. Do not bear false witness. It means do not lie. Lying's not good, right? Okay. Nobody really is like, no, that's not good. Well, there's white line. That's a little bit better, right? Okay, honor your father and mother. Okay, this guy says, to, okay, I've done all these things. I, I've kept these from my youth. So he's like, I've done all these things. Well, then Jesus is, you know, obviously Jesus asked him the question because he already knew what he was gonna do after he asked him the question. He's a good parent, set him up here. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Okay, here we go. Now we're gonna get serious because he's like, okay, hey, what do you do? And he's like, yeah, I do all those things so I should have a great life. I should have eternal life, right? And Jesus says, there's still one thing you lack. You still have an area in your life that is full of lack. Remember, this is what we've been talking about for months. The reason why we struggle so much is because we don't believe we're complete in Christ. We have these lack. We have this sense of lack within us, a, a deficiency, uh, uh, something that is, is not fulfilled. And so what we do is we go through our life trying to fulfill those things, not realizing that Jesus is our completion. He makes us totally complete. He said he's our shepherd and we lack nothing. So remember that context, okay? So he says, there's still one thing you lack. Sell all you have and distribute to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. I was like, you know, because this guy's looking at it. Wouldn't it be like, I'll do it. I'm on that because that's gonna change my life. And this guy's response was this. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. Now he kind of exposes everything. The reason why, when Jesus said this, why did he say that you have a lack? His lack wasn't finances. His, his abundant life was not in great wealth because he was great, greatly wealthy, very wealthy. Let's just put it that way. And so what's interesting is he comes along and says, uh, sell all that and follow me. And this guy's response was very sorrowful. Why? Because his lack was, was sufficed in his great wealth. He found security in it. He found purpose in it and he found meaning in it. And it made him feel comfortable and complete. How many would say this, if you were to be able to not have to raise your hand and answer the question that your life would be a million times better if you had a bunch of money? If you had a bunch of, like a boatload of money, you didn't have to think about bills, nothing. You just pay. How many would think, man, my life would be awesome? Let this just be honest. I'd be like, well, yes, right? I wouldn't go to work. I'd, just get, I'd be lazy, right? Why? Because I have no pressure, no problems, what it would seem like. Right, because it sounds like in our mind, most of my problems are connected to, in this life, finances. People are mad at you, just give them some money. They won't be mad at you anymore, right? <laughs> Solve all of our problems. So you think about how often, and for particularly this man, he said, you have a lot of confidence in your wealth. So I want you to do this, I want you to sell it all. And because really what you need is you need me. You need to follow me. Follow the way that I operate. And it said he was very sorrowful. Now, can I tell you this? What do you think his review would have been about the Jesus team? If he was to give a review, like, oh, I, I, I talked to this Jesus guy. He told me, I'm going to put this online and let people know that you don't follow this guy because he is just all about you giving your money away. Okay, stop and think about this. <laughs> think about what that would look like. And I, and I, th I thought a little bit about this because reviews are, are based on our experience. So we, ex we will give a review based on our experience or how this worked in our life or how, how we approached it or what happened that day. So his experience would have been like this. Don't go to this group. 
don't follow God because he's going to tell you to give all your stuff away. Have you ever thought about that? Don't follow him because he's going to ask you to give. So think about if you have anybody ever had a bad day, what would your review be? Because we know that God's ways are good and they're, they work. But what would your review be about church? Let me take a drink here real quick. Think about church. What would your review be about? Because church is a good place, right? I got in my notes, church is a good place. Think about this. Not all experiences are good. So if I base everything or my review or what I say or what I do based on my experience, what that will tell me is that I will base it on outcome. So if you ever had a bad day at church, you ever came into church, something not go well, maybe you were tired or, rude or sleepy and someone asked you something, you kind of answered them a little short and they're like, oh my God, they're mad this morning with this whole thing. And then you kind of don't talk to each other. Got this whole thing going on, all because you just didn't have a good day. So when I used to grow, I, I went to a charismatic church growing up, and uh, and I used to think, please don't come to my church. The reason is, is because, yeah, anybody ever been to a charismatic church? <laughs> you may be like, why? Why don't you come? Because you get a little rowdy. And what's interesting about my church is, at the time, was when I was growing up, is when they would get rowdy, they want you to get rowdy with them, because they think the key to you changing your life is just get a little rowdy. You just need to open up, and let God in. Come on. He's rowdy. So you just need to be rowdy. You'll get set free. And I was like, I'm not rowdy. And so I remember I would invite my friends or my friends like, hey, I'm going to come to church. And I'm like, no, that's good. You don't have to come. Because <laughs> my, my, that was my review of, of church. Why? Because at my church, we made Jericho March. Anybody ever know what a Jericho March is? We're going to march around the wall seven times. You got a problem? We're going to march around this church seven times. Let me just say this. There's nothing wrong with doing that. You march all that. You march all you want. Okay. Understand what I'm trying to say. I'm not making fun of that. I'm saying that I did not want people to come to my church because I thought as soon as they come, they're going to sit down and be like, hey, this is pretty cool because music was a little lively. But when it got to the brass tacks, it's like, hey, we're going to Jericho March this morning. They would look at me like, what's a Jericho March? And then they would get up and start marching and singing, and the walls came tumbling down. Joshua March seven times. And we're marching around the church. And, you know, and as they're marching, your friends are going like, and then they march by you. They're like, come on, let's march. You're like, no, let's not march. We're going to sit right here and we're going to watch. Now, my church, they would drag you out there to march because you just needed to get free. Right? Some of you are like staring at me like, oh my God, what church do you go to? Yeah. So anyway, so my review of it was don't come to my church. Now, why? Because I attributed God to that. Okay, so let me say, so most of the time when we look at church, we attribute God to the look of the church. So if the church is doing something, we think that God is like that. Can I tell you, that gives a really bit bad review of God. Can I tell you who's like that? We're like that. So what's interesting about it is we give reviews based upon the things that we experience and because we give those negative experiences or those things that aren't as great, we believe that God is that way. So let me just say one thing about God. He is always good. Always. He's not sometimes not good, sometimes bad. Well, the Old Testament, he got pretty wild and he's got crazy. Remember, that was still his goodness. He loved us so much. He was defending and protecting. And he has to be just, meaning this, that he holds himself to his word. So when he established things, when people broke those, he was justified. He was, he was necessary that he followed his word, right? Because if God does not just, everything collapses, okay? So he's always good. Now go to John chapter 16. Let me kind of dig in here a little bit more. So that was my review. So how many of you would recommend that church is life-changing? And just think about that for a minute. Church is life-changing. And the reason I'm asking you these questions is because we put a lot of Jesus with the church. And what I mean by that is we actually say that Jesus is the church in its essence, and, and it, he is the body of Christ, but what we're, we're his body, he's the head. But what we're trying to do is a lot of times we're saying that what the church is, that's who Jesus is. And can I tell you, we're trying to be like him, but we're not. We try. We work. We are trying to become more like him. So what happens is he gets identified a lot with how the church is. Why? Because we don't take the time to know him. We take time to know the functionality of the church. 
the way the church functions, the way this. Because if you go to churches, churches all function differently. They do this. Some churches, they get wild. You know, cares. we get a little wild. You know, you go to a Baptist church, they may just stand there. Some people may get a little rowdy and lift their hands. Uh, you go to a Catholic church, they're going to stand right there. They're going to go up and down a bunch. It is the way it works. But can I tell you, God is not like any of that. Why? Because that's us. That's us trying to connect to him in a way that we think he wants to be connected to. So we develop things that we do in ways that we connect with him, right? Are you guys tracking me so far? And the reason we do that is because it makes us feel like we're doing something that is godly. But can I tell you what he really wants? He just wants to know you and he wants you just to know him. He doesn't want all the theatrics of it. Yeah, we play music, we turn the lights down. You guys know why we turn the lights down in this church? People are like, well, you got to rock and roll. No, that's not what we're doing. We turn the lights down in the church because it's proven that when people don't think you can see them, they're more open to themselves. You're like, wow, we thought you just want to be rock and roll. You just developed a review about the kingdom of God without knowing the purpose behind it. You see, how, you see how that works, how easy that works? See how easy that we can develop a negative thought about God when that has nothing to do with him. That's just the way we function because we think it would help people connect with him more. And how many knows if you're in a bright open space and, and you really feel like lifting your hands, it's a little awkward to try to get those hands up, right? Because it's like nobody else is lifting them. I'm not gonna lift them because everybody's gonna like, what's this guy trying to do? Can I tell you this? Nobody's really ever thinking that. That's just what we think people think, okay? So I want you to go with me to John chapter 16. You guys okay so far? So that's why we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, his role, here's his role. Let's go to John 16. I'll read it to you really quick. Look at verse 13. However, when he, the Holy, the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. So he says he's the Spirit of truth and he's gonna guide us into all truth, all right? All truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit is not bringing his opinion. He's bringing what he knows that God has said and he is bringing that to you. He does not have a dog in the fight. He is telling you what God has already said, okay? He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you, talking about Jesus and his word. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit's goal is to take what Jesus has said and what he has given and declare it to us. So his job is to tell us what the truth is. He is the spirit of truth. And what's interesting about this, he will not give his opinion. He will not give his experience. He will give you what the actual reality of the word of God says. Isn't that, isn't that so good? I mean, that's just like, because let me just tell you this, reviews actually affect your perception. How many of you read a review at a restaurant and they were like, oh, it's terrible, the waitress is terrible, all these things are terrible, and you guys are like, I'm not eating there. Now, have you ever been there? What if that waitress was just having a bad day and this guy's just a jerk anyway and he just wanted to write there because he likes to give his opinion and so we just did that. And you're thinking, I missed out on things because I read somebody else's perspective and they may, I don't know their condition or their state. It may have been 100% accurate, but what if it's not the same for me? Well, it's gotta be the same for me because that's how it works because all churches are the same. God's the exact same. He acts just like those people in that church. He's judgmental. Think about it. But what's interesting about God is that he is, remember, his thoughts are higher than ours. His ways are higher than ours. He even says his thoughts are not my thoughts. So how I think is not how he thinks. So I'm working towards being transformed by trying to learn to think the way that he thinks, which is way different than me. So what's interesting is how do we get there? Yeah, let me, let me show you how the opinions affect you. You guys ever heard about uh, prosperity gospel? Right? How many of you are like a televangelist? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. How many of you have ever said this? Please don't raise your hand. All the church is about is money. Oh, my God. Let me just go ahead and drink my coffee here. Can I tell you, can I tell you the truth? So the truth is, is prosperity gospel is true. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have came here. Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? There's scripture that says this. One, he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. There's also a one in Proverbs that says, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, adds no sorrow to it. Third John 2, 
my desire above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So to deny that Jesus wants you prosperous is not true. That being said, prosperity is not just money. Prosperity, money is just, remember, let me just say this to you. Money is just an amplifier. No matter what I got going on here, no matter how much money I get, money would or it'll just amplify what's in my heart. So if I have got a corrupt or a, a hurt heart, when I get a bunch of money, I'll just have a bunch of money with a hurt heart. Does that make sense? If I'm cheap and I get a bunch of money, I'll just be cheap with a bunch of money. It doesn't change anything. It just amplifies it because you now have more of it. Prosperity is based upon how you're able to have a better quality of life. And Jesus is trying to tell us, I desire above all things that you prosper. I came that you would have life in abundance. I want you to have abundant life. But what we do because we're afraid of prosperity gospel, we're like, well, you can't have that. What if you can't? What if because you have the right heart and you're not fearful and money doesn't control you, what if he wants to bless your life with finances so that you can be a blessing to other people? Just maybe. But think about because of that review, it's like no way he could do that. So what we do is we take one little thing, one little sample, and we'll say this is what God looks like. Why? Because we don't know what he's like. We're just going off what somebody tells us. And if somebody says that person's evil, how many of you see people on TV and you make a judgment against them already because of what they say, and you don't even know them or know anything about them? Oh, man. Why? Well, I, I can tell by their fruit. You hear what they're saying. But people can manipulate what they say all the time. This is what's interesting is because it's easy for me to make a judgment based on a one, one conversation. Everything, we need everything black and white in our life. Why? Because gray scares us because gray is freedom. Really in that area of freedom, it's not black and white. Because people aren't black and white in the sense that they are not just this or that. They're really kind of a mixture of things. And so what happens is we've got to know each person individually. Because what happens, if you've ever been hurt by a male, you'll say all males are, you ever been hurt by a female, I'll say all females are, why? Because you're drawing a conclusion based upon an experience. And because of that, I will build walls or I'll build rejections or I won't be a part of it. I'll never date again, I'll never do this, why? Because in that environment is hurt. Why? Because I'll never, it makes me not get to know something. It gives me just an opinion to just stay away from it all. Come on, this is interesting. Let's go a little further. You guys wanna dig in a little bit more? Go to Romans chapter one. Here's how this works. Here's how this has kind of divulged into this situation. Romans chapter one. So this is what was going on before Jesus. I'm gonna read Romans one. And I'm gonna read 20 through 25, okay? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Now, this is important. They knew God. Can I tell you, a lot of people know about God. They know that there's God. They know there's a God out there. But it says that they knew God, but they did not glorify him as God. Nor were they thankful, but became futile or empty or vain in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were dark. In professing to be wise, they became fools. So they begin to say, God and his ways are stupid. They don't help me out. And he said, our ways are, are wiser. Like what I do makes me feel better. How many of you know that doing what you do makes you feel better? Why? Because you've decided what makes you feel better. So you do those to make you feel better. It means this, if somebody hurts you or does something to you you don't like, if you alienate them from your life, you will feel better that you alienated them from your life. But can I tell you, you still didn't deal with what is going on in your heart because of the hurt that just caused and the offense that will hold on. So you actually feel better because you alienated them, but that's just professing to be wise in your own knowledge because we think that's the best way. Oh yeah, that's good, right? Yeah, come on, woo-woo. 
professing to be white. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man and birds, four-footed animals, creeping things. Verse 24, here we go. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Verse 25, who exchanged the truth for a review. I added that. Exchanged the truth of God for a lie or a review in this instance. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. So this is what was going on. They became wise. They started to get information, knowledge into their life that they said that if I do this, I feel better about my life. And God is, is he's just rude and he just is evil and he's just, so we'll just push away from him and we'll become a God unto ourselves. I'll make my own decisions and that's good. And he said, professing that wisdom, we became foolish. And he said, and we exchanged our God for something that we could see and feel and touch. We created him in an image that's like us so that we could understand it and we could feel better about it. Why? Because we had a mixed review about who God was. And if you've gone to church very long, you can get a very mixed review about who he is. Most of your reviews about God tell you that he's really mad at you. If you do something wrong, he's mad at you. And he sits up there like this until you get straightened out. And he's like, okay, I'm better now. Right? I've had people tell me in my life that God is sitting up there watching you and just watching you. And he's like, mm, Josh. And can I tell you, that is not anywhere in the Bible. There's no truth to that. That's what a parent would say, right? I, wa I see you. I have eyes in the back of my head. Why do I say that? Because I want you to know, even when I'm not looking, I see you. But do I have eyes in the back of my head? Absolutely not. But I tell you that because if I can get you to believe that, I'll hold you accountable. So if I can tell you God's mad at you, if you do things that are not right, it can hold you more accountable. Why? It's because it makes us feel like that we have somebody that's lording over us. Because it's hard for us to believe that God has forgiven us of all of our sin, past, present, and future. That's hard to believe, right? Because I'm good about forgiving you if you've hurt me in the past, but if you hurt me right now, I may not like you. Or if you're gonna hurt me in the future, I may not like you there either. But remember, think about this. He's already forgiven them, and he's forgiven me of those. Does it say I should do them? Absolutely not, because my quality of life will get worse if I respond that way to things. If I respond that's against his nature, it may make me feel better for a moment, but my quality of life will get worse. If I hold unforgiveness, my quality of life will get worse. And it will begin to pollute every area of my life. Isn't that interesting? But God's not mad at you. Wow. See, that's hard to qualify, right? Why? Because he's already done his work. His work is finished. Jesus accomplished it, said it right, gave us the authority back, said, you're forgiven, you're good, you are right standing with me, go live in freedom. And we're like, I don't know if I can handle that. Why? Because I get to make decisions. And I get to make decisions that alter my life. Can I, I said this last week, the decisions of my life right now, the quality of my life right now is a sum total of all the decisions that I've made. It is not the decisions of other people that they've made, it's the decisions that I've made. Why? Because you can't affect my life unless I agree with the decision that you're making about me. Are you writing this down? Because this is really interesting. So you can't affect me. It's just like this. If someone tells you you're terrible at this, the only way that you'll ever be terrible at it is if you start to agree with them and then it begins to affect your belief about what you do. Come on, has anybody ever just judged you and looked at your stuff and you, you're like, man, I'm looking good in this outfit today. Woo! Feeling good. And then someone says, it looks like Star Trek. My sister told me that this morning. Aaron, hey, 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 and let's check this out. Aaron told it to me and so did my sister. So, hey, but listen, check this out. That's okay because I think I like Star Trek anyway. But I wasn't really feeling like Captain Kirk until now because Aaron looked at me and went, like, I appreciate that, guys. Hey, but I told you I like it. Come on. Yeah, so check this out. So, yeah, so now it looks like pumpkin spice. I know that, yeah. So, so see, I was really confident walking out of the house, boom, killing it, white shoes, all this stuff. Now it's like, look like Captain Kirk drinking pumpkin spice latte as I go. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I just made that up. But think about this. So it only affects me if I begin to believe the opinions that are told me. It didn't bother me one bit that they said that. Not one bit. 
But just show you how easily it can change the way you perceive something because someone gave you a review. And we begin to believe it when the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us and tells us who we are. So he says, what happened? They exchanged that truth for a lie. They begin to believe that, that their wisdom or this, let me just say it this way. God is not a Dave Ramsey program either. Meaning this, that I'll just do what God says. I'll go to church. I'll follow these rules and he'll bless me. That's not how that works either. His principles are good. They will work. But without knowing him, they'll always have a corruption to them. Because when you begin to operate in principles based upon not love, but based upon some other heart, they become lustful really fast. So you can obey his biblical principles on finances, but eventually your heart will become lustful about money because it's not based on him and his love for you. It's based on, I've got a way to get finances better. Does that make sense? Why? Because it's not about these principles. It's just about, it's about knowing him. Because once principles are in order without relationship and love, religion will take over like that. Well, I'll do this because this is what God expects, but I don't know him at all. I don't talk to him. I don't even know anything about him. I know that he's in heaven and he's big and he's massive. He created all this stuff, but I don't know him. Because the re reason why, if, if, if we know him, we know truly how his nature is, which is nature looks just like Jesus that he loves you, he died for you, he is for you, he's not against you. He is there to walk you through the Holy Spirit. Every time you fall, he is there to pick you back up. Why? Because he's that kind of a father, he's that kind of a parent. That's how awesome he is. A couple more verses, are you guys ready for this? Verse 26, read it real quick. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Just stop right there, That's, we don't need to go any further. You can read all the way down through there and you'll see all the vile passions. That word vile actually means the word disgraceful. And we think that word means like, oh, that sounds like a real heavy word, but actually disgrace means away from grace. So they're actually passions that are not full of grace. They're full of, they're full of, of lust or self-focus. And what ends up happening is, is, is if you'll read down that list from about 27 all the way through about 32, you'll find out that we've probably operated in about 90% of them. And what's interesting about that, why do we operate in about 90% of those? Because we believe the lie. And we believe that God was expectation was perfect behavior. And when we start to journey down that road of perfect behavior, we fall short really fast. So then we don't know what to do except to try to try harder at it. And when we try harder at it and we keep falling still, why? Because transformation does not come from us trying harder. It comes from us yielding to the work that Jesus did on the cross and believing that you are complete right now. That's a tough one, I know it. Just go ahead and just swallow. You ever swallowed a pill and it's kind of hard to get down? Just keep drinking water. It'll go down. Why? Because it's hard for us to believe that he really finished that work. That he did it and he gave it to us as a gift. Righteousness is a gift. You cannot earn it. Righteousness means right standing with God. You can't earn that. He just gave it to you. It's apart from our works. Now, does that mean I live reckless? No, because it's still destructive. Sin always produces death but I don't want to get in distrust. Remember, sin's just unbelief. I don't want to get in not trusting God and start trusting in my own self or my own ways. I want to trust him. Why? Because his ways are better. Go to Philippians chapter three. Here we go. One more little detail, okay? Philippians chapter three, look at verse seven. I'll read it up here so I don't have to turn. But what things were gained to me, this is Paul, okay? So Paul had every reason to be like, I'm awesome because he truly was awesome. But watch this. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted as loss for Christ. And yet indeed, I count also, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Or I count all things of loss because how awesome it is to know him. Okay, let me put it in my words. My Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He said it's worth all those things that I thought were gains to be lost and counted as dung compared to this. And be found in him. Now, this is, what, this is the crux of everything. He said, the reason why I count all those things as lost and done, all those things I achieved because of this right here. And be found in him. I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Now, what does that mean to us? Not having my own righteousness means this. It wasn't based on me. In any form, it was based on him. He says, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law or keeping the law, 
but that which is through faith in the work or in Christ, in the work of Christ, the righteousness which, which is from God that comes to us by faith. He said, I, I, I count all these things, all these achievements. I don't, I don't mind losing them. Why? Because of the excellence of knowing him and knowing and being found in him, not having my own efforts qualify me, but having his work qualify me. That's what I want. Why? Because when you have that qualification, that means that it has nothing to do with you. Therefore, you do not have any standard that you have to bring to him. Because anytime we approach God, we think he's really examining us. Remember I told you last week, when you walk up to somebody, the first thing most people do is they'll look at you, then they'll look down you, and they'll look up you. Why? Because they're judging you. They're just scanning you down to see what you are. Alexa told me this the other day. She said, this makes people really uncomfortable when you, when you talk to them. She looks at me and then she starts looking like to this part of my head. And I'm like, yeah, that does make me uncomfortable. Why? Because it looks like if they're not looking me in the eye, something's wrong with me. So this is the thing about it. He said, you can come before the Father. And when he looks at you, actually, First John says, you can approach or stand before him without fear. Because I can tell you right now that if, if we were to say, hey, check this out today, we're all going to get to stand before God. He's going to show up here in just a minute. He's going to sit right back here. And we're all going to one, one at a time walk up here and stand before him. How many of you be like, I'll come back next week whenever we, we have uh, more time? <laughs> right? Why? Because that sounds terrifying, right? To walk up before God. Now, why would it be terrifying? Let me ask you this. Why would it be terrifying for you to walk up and stand before God right now? Because you feel like you're not worthy to stand before him that everything you are, he's like examining you. He's going to be like, Josh, what about this thing you're keeping secret? Hey, put this on the TV. Everything Josh is keeping secret. Check it out, church. That's our fear, right? Because if you didn't have any fear, you could stand before him confident. And it says this, his perfect love casts out fear. Then you may be able to stand before God without fear of judgment. That's how he wants us to be. He wants us to be able to walk into his presence and be fearless. How can I be fearless? Because it's not based on me. It's based on Jesus. And if I've received the work of Jesus, I can stand before him because I did not qualify for this. He gave it to me as a gift. And man, I'm thankful that he gave me that gift because I could not do it on my own. I could not. I'm not worthy enough, no matter how hard I try to be able to stand before him. And if I am in this room and I think I could stand before him on my behavior, let me just tell you, you're about to hit a nosedive into your life and it will crumble under your feet because none of us are righteous. No, not one. He's the only one. Now watch this. This is a little scary, but it's okay. So why would Paul want to give all this up? Now watch, this is what Paul's like. Check this out. Although I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks they may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. So he's like, hey, if you think you got some confidence about who you are, he said, I'm just gonna let you know that my pedigree is way better than yours according to being acceptable before God, okay? He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel because every male was circumcised the eighth day after they were born, okay? So he was doing that and he's from Israel. He's not from Salina. He's from Israel. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm of the, maybe Cherokee, Something like that? Nope. He's of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes. Is it the 12 or 11 tribes? 12. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, he's a Pharisee. Okay, now what's that mean? Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. He persecuted Jesus because they felt like they were false prophets. Concerning the righteousness, which is the law. Here's, here's where it gets me. Blameless. So let's just interpret what he said. He said, I was a Pharisee. And he said, concerning the law of God, I've kept it blamelessly. What does that mean? That means this, that every law that you read that they were given, Paul kept them to the letter. So if anybody could say, according to my flesh, according to who I am, I should be acceptable to God. Paul said, I would be that guy. I would be that guy, I would be blameless. But this is the amazing part about it. As Paul said, I count all that as dung compared to knowing him and being found in him in his righteousness and what he has given me through the work of Jesus. And I accept that through faith and trust in what Jesus did for me. Isn't that awesome? Look at verse 10. Here's the last verse. This is the Amplified. For my, deter for my determined purpose is that I may know him. 
that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. And that I may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers. And that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to his death in the hope. That if possible, I may attain to the spiritual, moral, and resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while I was in the body. So he said simply this. He said, I've counted all that loss because so that I can know him, intimately know him, and the power of his resurrection. Now, what does that mean? That I may know who he is, but the power outflowing from his resurrection means this, is the power outflowing from his right standing, that, the right standing that he gave us. See, when you have right standing, you have confidence. Remember, when you have right standing, that equals freedom. When you have right standing, it equals confidence. And when you have that confidence, you have the ability to move through life without this fear of always failing God. So what he's trying to tell us, Paul's like, listen, I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You can go and read, he said, I've not attained that yet, but I keep pursuing that daily. I've not perfectly got this down. I don't, I, there's still areas that I, I struggle with lack in. He said, but I am pursuing this daily. But I want you to see the context today as, we're, as we get ready to dismiss about this, is this, is that he wants to know you. Paul said, I want to know him. So I want you to just let that thought set for just a moment. I want you to stand to your feet really quick. I want you to just close your eyes. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement here, and I want you to just kind of uh, uh, let the Holy Spirit just speak to you about it. We, we all struggle with, with, with a lack of deficiency. With an area that we feel like that we're in pursuit of to either be more qualified or more acceptable to God. And can I, can I say this? That, that that fulfillment of that lack is knowing him. It's, know, it's knowing who he is. Knowing who he is to you and knowing what he has done for you. It's just like in a relationship. The importance of that relationship is not doing everything right because that's what religion looks like. It's about knowing the person. Because knowing the person makes it relational. Doing things doesn't make it relational. It makes it religious. Because when I know the person, and I love the person, my response becomes to do things that cause that person to be, to feel accepted and loved. And so what we do is we do things because if we do things, we feel like it will make us acceptable and loved. But today I want you to just let, just let you know that you don't have to do things for, the, for God to love you. You don't have to be perfect for God to love you. He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for open people, people that are just open to him. So this morning, I just want to kind of just open up the door this morning to this, this truth of knowing Jesus. Because if you're like me, the Jesus I knew of or I was taught was not the most fun to find because he was too good for me. He was too good for me to talk to because I was never good enough. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want you to know that this Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brethren, it says. It means this, no matter what you're facing, no matter what shortcomings that you've had this week or how you've not lived up to the standard, he's not ashamed to call you his brother or his sister. Why? Because he loves you. And those struggles... Whenever we get into the presence of God and we get into the place where we are about finding the presence of God, it says in one of the Psalms that the heels, they melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. That problems and mountains, they begin to have no effect whenever the presence of the Lord is there. So my question is to you is, do you know 
this Jesus who I'm talking about. The one of the gospel. The one that loves you without reservation. The one that accepts you. And so if that's you this morning, and I just want to really quick just ask you this question. If that's you and you don't know the Jesus that I've I'm, I'm been talking about, because remember a prayer or going through a, a ritualistic thing is not mean my life is saved. What causes salvation or born again experience is the confession that Jesus is the Lord and to believe that God raised him from the dead. And to believe that God raised him from the dead is to believe that you become justified by faith through that process. That's what that means. Because he was raised for our justification to be cleared right. So if that's you this morning, what I want to simply ask you, if you've never accepted him in that work of the cross, his death, his burial and resurrection, I just want to simply ask you to do this morning, just simply just lift your hand I'm not going to ask you to come up to the front. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm just going to pray with you this morning. I just want to know that you're here so that we can make that, we can make that a for sure today, a confidence in your life. If that's you, just quickly lift your hand. You put it up, put it right back down. I just want to see that you're here. No better thing, no necessary thing than to know him. Don't be afraid. So what I want you to do now is we're just going to pray. I just want to pray for our church family this morning as we dismiss this morning. And I want you to just open your heart up to receive. Because my prayer this morning is that we would know him. Father, I pray right now that, that no matter what we've experienced on our journey to this point in our life, we've had mixed reviews, we've had up days, down days, bad things. This happened. We've been hurt at church. We've, we've not had good experiences in church. But Lord, I, I pray today that 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 we would not attribute those things to who you are because you are good and you love your people. And I pray today that as we open up our hearts to receive that love, that there would be a more intimacy of knowing you, knowing who for you, who you really are. Not organized in a prayer, not organized in this, but truly just a, a raw opening of who I am. That our prayers would be like this, Father, this is, who, this is who I am, and I need you. Come on, just, Father, just let that sincerity of heart be what births out of our conversations with you. And I pray that transformation and truth would just begin to light that up. I pray, Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would guide us into all truth. Those that are fearful or struggling in their faith, I pray that you would bring them and reveal yourself to them this morning that they would know truly who you are and the power that flows out from your resurrection. And we thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Come on up here this morning, Jesse. Hey, I want you guys to know something very, I appreciate you. I appreciate your heart, your openness. I, I, always, want to, I always want you to leave here challenged in your faith. Um, I know that culturally, um, we don't like things to be challenged because it really messes with us. But I want you to always challenge what you hear and what you hear people say or what you've been taught. Why? Because it ultimately has to be what you believe. And if you just take what someone says as truth, 